Yeah, it's, I mean, I've seen people die in every way you can, shooting, stabbings, kidnappings, fires, you know, drowning. In my career, because I hunted fugitives six years uh, in, down in Dayton. Mm -hmm. So I was all over Philly, Cleveland, Dayton, Pittsburgh, Erie. So when I got, when I saw this, it wasn't that I see, oh God, another guy dying. This was just really bizarre because you didn't expect it. Yeah. You're thinking, no way that's real. Because I've been to so many hoax bank robberies where they, I seen one guy, you know, they take flares together, or one guy put a binocular case with an antenna sticking out, you know, just weird shit. But you get in there and you look and you go, oh, this is another hoax. You know, just stand up, let's get this off, let's go. And then, boom. Oh my. There's the keyholes that he was supposed to get keys. By the way, there were no keys, so they weren't getting it Did off. Did he know yeah. it was a real bomb? He didn't know. They but told him it was fake. Scheme, he right? was part of the scheme, but he was told it was fake. It wasn't going to go off, so just go ahead and rob it. If you get caught, you're a hostage. Yeah. If you don't get caught, we split the money and everybody's good. So he, he thought it was fake. So that's, that's the actual, it, it went like a handcuff and then ratcheted shut and wouldn't, wouldn't open up. People don't give law enforcement enough credit a lot of times without yeah. the ability to take stuff from nothing and turn it into this. And then here's the actual chest uh, yeah, box. Yeah, I seen. He had, so he had a t-shirt over it? Exactly. He had the, the box. And wasn't uh, he carrying a cane that was a it, gun? He had a cane gun too. And Mike, here's your point. There's the second pipe bomb that never went off. There's the one that exploded. He did it as a design flaw. He tried to cap it and, uh, with, with plates instead of mm -hmm. uh, end caps. And what happened was air got in there and that'll render a oh. device inert and it won't work. And then that's the total box that hung on his chest right here. So so you're saying he was part of it, right? He was part of it. So, um, he, so he let them put it on his neck and... Here's what happens, James. This is so cool. He's, he's all in on the plot, right? decides at the last second when he shows up to deliver the pizzas when he sees this thing for the first time yeah he says you know what that looks too real i don't want to wear that yeah. you know i don't think i want to do this anymore and they said too late they hit him mm -hmm. knocked him to the ground that's why he had dirt on his knees in that one photo in the bank yeah. put it around his neck and say it's not real just wear it and go do it and that's why he went so when you think of the story he told it was a false story yeah that's his aggregate circumstance. That's a bad circumstance for him because he, he could have ended it that day. Mm -hmm. This guy did it, this guy did it. No, he stuck with the story. So he was in on it, but he got duped. And that's when the device went off and killed him. But three days later, after this thing happens, August 28th is when it happened, August 31st, a second pizza delivery driver dies of an overdose in the same company, the same, same, same pizza, pizza shop. shop. So two dead pizza delivery drivers within three days. Oh, wow. uh, now you're starting to think, all right, I'm an investigator. These have to be connected, right? There's no way you could have two dead guys. Uh, there's the second man dies. We go in his house. He dies of a Xanax methadone uh, combination, which we call in the business a hot shot. He basically was given that to kill him. Yeah. All right. So that means that he knew about what's going on. If it's not crazy enough, right, two dead pizza guys in in two to three days. Three weeks later, this guy calls the FBI and uh, Pennsylvania State Police and says, hey, listen, I'm driving around and I got a, uh, a gun in, the v in my van, I'm gonna kill myself, but I gotta tell you, in the garage of my house, in the freezer, there's a dead body. And we're like, you gotta be kidding me. Now another dead body, and look, this is where the pizzas were delivered that day. Yeah. There's the dead body in that Again, another coincidence, or is this related to? So now we got three dead people within three weeks. So that so Rothstein ended up killing himself. And no, no he, he dying ended up. Of cancer. Yeah, he ends up dying of cancer years later. Not years later, months later. I apologize. Mm -hmm. Months later, he dies of cancer. But he was fooling us. He was never really going to kill himself. Mm -hmm. He was sort of, um, sort of trying to lead us down the wrong path. Here's the inside of his house. Here's actually his suicide note that he had written. But look what he writes as number one. 
to do with world <laughs> So he thought enough to make us try to think they weren't related. But again, they turned out that they are going to be related, and I'll show you. Here's the search warrant we do in there. Uh, it's the absolute disgusting. Mm -hmm. So Marjorie Deal Armstrong, who's a famous eerie murderer, mm -hmm. um, Mike probably knows her from way back, but she killed multiple people. I'll show her in a second. Uh, she shoots this guy twice in the back, calls Rothstein, he goes over to get the body, and they put it in the freezer in his garage. Uh, and you open it up and say, is there really going to be a dead body in this freezer? Mm -hmm. And you open it up, and sure enough, uh, Lyle Cook, the coroner, was there. You know, that body was frozen in here so solid that we couldn't get it out. So we had to unplug the freezer. Let it thaw out. Let it thaw out for three days at the coroner's office. We had to take a van, put the whole freezer in the van, take the mm -hmm. whole thing. And three days later, we could get that body out. Do we know why he was killed? Yes. At the end, we do. Not then, but at the end, we figure it out. And I'll put this all together at the end for you, uh, which we'll get to in two seconds. They basically were going to cut that body up with a chainsaw, put it in an ice crusher, and get rid of all the evidence. Yeah. And that's how they were going to dispose of it. So you're starting to think, oh my God, all these people involved, right? Well, here's, here's Marjorie, who shot him. He's the guy that ends up in the freezer, James Roden. Uh, she shoots him, and why she shoots him becomes interesting to us later, once we piece it all together. But it took us a little bit of time to put this all together. Because she's immediately arrested for shooting him. Mm -hmm. She's sent to jail, but she's declared incompetent to stand trial, so I couldn't interview her, because you can't interview an incompetent person. So I had to wait for her to be declared competent. But look at her. She's a valedictorian at Academy, uh, when Academy was going. Oh, uh, really smart. That's her multiple degrees. But then she, she had a, a sort of twist of fate. She, she shot a guy in the 86 times, was acquitted because she, she claimed it was a batter situation. She got mm -hmm. off on that. She took another uh, husband to the hospital, bleeding from his ear. He dies a couple days later. Uh, we find out years down the road, she hit him in the head with a baseball bat. Right. Uh, she said he fell and hit a coffee table. Then she shot the guy that ends up in the freezer, so that's three, and uh, she's sent away for confidence. By the way, she's our third book. We're writing a book right now at Palatel and I. We've written Is she a giving books. you interviews? She's talking to Ed every day. But she doesn't admit to doing stuff. She's yeah. very, she's the one of the strangest people. I interviewed her eight times. Didn't she threaten you? Oh yeah, she threatened, she put a contract out on us from the jail, mm -hmm. hiring a uh, Latin gang king uh, a member uh, of one of the inmates' friends to kill him. Uh, we start putting some evidence together. Remember our call order in the pizzas? Well, think about this. If you see someone at that payphone at 1.30 and that's when the call comes in ordering those pizzas, that's a big deal. Right. Uh, well, don't we have a UPS driver who doesn't call me till 2005, but a UPS driver driving by sees Rothstein with Marjorie standing next to him at the payphone at 1.30. And you know why this is great trial evidence? You know those tablets, which are really computers they have in their truck? Look at 13.30, 1.30. He's going by 80.40 Peach. Yeah perfect when he testified at trial it's like because sometimes people say oh sure you were there or mm -hmm. you might not have been there here it is his computer told him where he was right. so it was just outstanding information second guy that didn't come forward right away uh, because he thought it was wrong the day before the bombing he sees Wells leaving that tower site mm -hmm. but he said I didn't call you because it was the day before I didn't think it was important well it was important because we heard there was a pre-planning meeting at the tower site the day before and Wells was there. So again, that solidifies that Wells is involved right. in the case. He even had to skid on, on the road so he wouldn't uh, hit him. Here's uh, what Mike was talking about with, um, with Marjorie trying to hire uh, one of the inmates to kill Jason Wick and myself. She wanted us sniped. Um, thank God the inmate she was trying to hire mm -hmm. was talking to us. Oh, okay. So the inmate said, hey, you might want to know that uh, Marjorie's trying to kill you. So when you heard that news, how did you, were you well, scared? I, you know what? We the FBI takes so seriously, so they they put in some security systems in our homes. We did some private stuff. We do, you know, instead of driving straight home, I I have to make some routes, go through parking lots, you know, make sure nobody's following you. We took some action about it. But here's the plot. This all boils down to this. 
Marjorie Deal Armstrong's dad had about $2 million at one time. She's an only child. Her mother died. Mm -hmm. She wants the money right now. The only way to do that is to have him dead. The only way to have him dead is to kill him. So she says to Ken Barnes, hey, I'm j I want my dad dead. Do you know who would kill him? Barnes says, I'll kill him, but I need 250 grand. Well, where are we going to get 250 grand? Let's rob the bank. So the whole plan for this crazy scheme was to rob the bank to get the 250000 to pay Ken Barnes to kill her dad to get $2 million. That's greed, you know, yeah. and that's power and greed at its absolute worst. Well, well, as it turns out, when he used to go over to Barnes's house, Marjorie would be there, they'd talk about it, talked him into being the driver, said you can't get hurt, you can't lose. If you get caught, you're a hostage. Mm -hmm. He agreed to do it, but the day, like I told you, he tried to back out, that's when they knocked him down, uh, dirt on the knees, but he stuck with that darn story, which will always kill me. Um, Rothstein made the device. What about Panetti? Remember our second pizza? Yes, well, he was in too. He was, his job and what he was going to get paid to do was make sure Wells continued on with the plot. So he was always there to convince them. Once it happened and he died, they knew they couldn't leave him alive. Right. So they give, Ken Barnes gave him a hot shot and killed him. So three days later, he's dead. What about him, the guy in the freezer? Well, it turns out he was involved initially. He gets in a fight with Marjorie uh, before the thing happens and says, you know what, I'm going to go tell the authorities about that. She doesn't let him live to long enough to do it. Shoots him and, twice. And didn't uh, she then call Rothstein and said, do you have a freezer? She and calls, he went and bought the freezer. He didn't have one. So they had to go to Rex Appliance Store, which was here then. Now it's gone. Uh, I had a receipt <laughs> from Rex Appliance, them buying this freezer, wow. to put him in. It's just amazing what evidence we had to gather. So all these people were involved, seven of them total. This guy was living in Rothstein's house. He's a fugitive from the state of uh, Washington State, um, wanted for rape. So we found him five days later hiding in Girard, uh, dragged him out of a house. He was hiding in there. Well, that was really a, a crazy day. But Marjorie and Ken, the rest of them all died. So Marjorie and Ken, uh, well, there's her dad. Poor guy was the nicest guy you'll ever meet. And here she was trying to kill him. He since died. Uh, he gave away all that money. He, he gave it away to neighbors. Wow. Like on East 25th, um, anybody that was a neighbor, he was just giving money away, 30000 40000 at a pop. Um, Rothstein was losing his house, so he needed money. This wasn't one of those good forensic cases. I didn't have a lot of evidence. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, that payphone. There was DNA in that payphone, but there was a blend. They called it a mix. So many people had used it. They couldn't isolate one strand of DNA out of it, so I didn't have anything. This was more of a, a like a, we just had to keep going back at people. You know, it was an interviewing case. It was an interviewing uh, interrogation case. That's how we won this thing. Jason Wick, uh, we just met, one of the best interviewers you'll ever meet. And a couple different times, uh, he just knows what questions to ask. He's he's good at, and we played a lot of the you know roles where if I got along with somebody, he knew when to come in. Mm -hmm. If he got along, I knew when to stay back and let him. It's a real art form interviewing. Right. It's a lost art because our kids, you know, they're real good with this and this, but nobody's talking to anybody Thank anymore. You. It's a skill set, and Jason has that skill. Uh, one time we're in the jail, I'll never forget this, and Barnes uh, said, that's it, I'm done talking to you guys. I don't want to talk anymore. He stood up, and Jason, we start walking to the door, and Jason said, hey, Ken, it looks like I struck a nerve. Simple thing like that, right? Barnes cocks on him, and he's getting ready to hit him, and I, I you know, sort of jumped between them. Jason, you know, pretty good-sized guy. Yeah. I said, Ken, you don't want any part of that. And he said, no, and then the guards all come running in because they're watching us on film, you know, in the jail. It's a very tight monitor. Uh, so they took him back to the jail. The other time, when he, before he was arrested, he was out walking around, and he got in the car. We used to always go pick him up. I knew exactly where he'd be because he was very ritualistic. Mm -hmm. Picked him up. Ken, get in. No, I don't want to get in. Get in. We want to talk to you. Got in. He ends up pulling a knife out. 
and I put my gun to the back of the seat because I was in the back seat. Jason's driving. He's in the front seat. Put my gun in the back of the seat. I was just ready to squeeze it off if he's lunging towards Jay. So that kind of stuff happened all during this thing. And interviewing him 18 times, Marjorie nine times, uh, Rothstein four or five times. It took the interviewing skill set to get this thing through. Finally, we indicted through a grand jury, Marjorie and Ken. Ken, to his credit, came in and pled to 45 years in jail, 45, and then agreed to testify against her. She went to trial, three week long trial. I was on the stand five hours defending the investigation how we did it, you know, did you give Marjorie a break? Did you let her go to the bathroom when you interviewed her? Did you, I mean, unbelievable how investigators get put on trial. But that's our system, because beyond a reasonable doubt is a very high burden, and we want to make sure nobody's in jail that doesn't deserve to be. So I, I get it, but it's a tough, tough system that we have to get through to get there. She, uh, that's, that's Barnes being arrested by Jason and I in our thinner days. Uh, yeah, we both look older and heavier, I'll tell you that. Uh, but you got to figure that's 2003. Uh, that's Marjorie uh, with Jason. Yeah, that was me back here. Mm -hmm. By the way, I ever tell you this story? This is unbelievable. And then I, I, I don't want to bore you with stories, no, but that's really? Story. Okay. Marjorie gets in the car. Wait, let me show you this because this is right after she does this. See if you can see. And a lot of people have seen this ad nauseum. But it's good to hear her voice so that you know exactly what she's like and what she's about. She is one, one of the most interesting people you'll ever meet in your life. So this is my explorer. This is me and Jay. We're getting her out. And there's uh, all three channels were there. They're trying to get her. Anything you'd like to say, Marjorie? I'm innocent. Where were you the day that Ryan Wells was killed? They said you're the mastermind of the collar bombing. What do you say? Where's she even looking? You know what I mean? She's got no connection with humans. Chip. Now she'll say something at the end that's right here. Absolutely not. She just, she was one of, so she's barking the whole way out too, same way. We put her in the car and she's going, the FBI railroaded me, Jerry Clark, yeah, no good, Jason Wick, no good. And the door shuts. I'll never forget this. Her attorney's in the back, she's there, I'm Jason up here. Uh, soon as the door shuts and we're driving away, she goes, hey, sorry, I had to do that. Wow. And I said, damn, this, this is unbelievable. I mean, she can manipulate and turn and, and I said, hey, no, no issue. You know, I'm not going to worry about that. That's, I don't take that personal. Going up French, she sees the Wendy's right there on 12th and French. She said, hey, can you stop in the Wendy's? I'm not kidding. I go, I look at her attorney. He goes, yeah, all right, go ahead. She goes, because I know I missed, you know, dinner. And I said, all right, let's go back in. We go into the Wendy's. Now, I have to go through the drive through because I can't put Marjorie in there. Mm -hmm. But uh, we go through the drive through I said, and I, I'll never forget it. I'm at the drive through and I turn around and I say, hey, Marge. Uh, what, what do you want? And she says, get me a triple. I go, you can't eat a triple. And she says, yes, I can. And Biggie says, so surprised. And she sat in the back of my car. I'm not kidding you. She opened it up. She's got her handcuffs too. She opened it up and she, instead of eating a burger like a burger, like we do, mm -hmm. right? She broke it into pieces like a bird, like it was piled in a pile and then picked and ate the pieces like that. That's how she ate that thing. She ate the whole thing though with the fries and all Weird. and took her, it just bizarre. But that's one of those stories that when they're talking about the movies and you know, things that we're going to do in the future, mm -hmm. those scenes I'm telling you will be portrayed mm -hmm. because they're so unique and they show the, the, the so characters. Work we're working on what a, is there a movie that, that, kind of, that exactly James. They did a, uh, a thing what called, called, um, 30 minutes or less. 30 minutes, I've seen it. A yes. Times, and it, they, they swore that it wasn't off of this, but it was. You know, yeah. it basically stole yeah. the because idea. Where, um, where he was knocked to his knees. Right. In the movie, it's a, a abandoned site that looks. 
<laughs> just like it? Yeah, it just See, and I never saw it, but uh, they, they started with us on a feature. They're now looking at an eight-part series, uh, like a Netflix type, mm -hmm. because it's so complex, they're afraid they can't get it all in two hours. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they're going to do it as a, as a series. Does so she admit to it now? No. What she admits to, and here's what she'll say, when, even today when we talk to her, Listen, Rothstein put me in positions where I would be seen and look like I was guilty, but I never knew what was going on. So I was at the tower site. I was at the Shell station. She didn't deny any of that. That's how smart she was. She said, if you have me on film at the Shell station, she said, then I guess I must have been there. And I thought, oh, that's interesting that she thought uh, that far ahead. And I said, well, all right, we do have you on film. But we, we really, we didn't, because we didn't have exterior footage. We only had interior. Mm -hmm. But we did have Ken Barnes going inside buying gas, which he confirmed and told us, yep, and he even picked himself out of the video saying, that's me. Yeah. So we, we, she'll admit that. But here's how she thinks twistedly. She said, M Bill Rossi knew he was dying, so he thought he would get me framed for this and put in jail for life so that no one else could have me, yeah. like she was some big prize, right? Yeah. <laughs> that somebody won, <laughs> right? And I'm looking at her going, <laughs> you're no prize there, Mark. But that, that's, that's how she thought. But she could quote Plato, and that's why when, when you think of criminals, a lot of times you're thinking, oh, man, they're not real bright, you know, in, in some way. They were very intelligent. Yeah. They were very intelligent. They just weren't very criminally savvy. But in the whole group, and then that's doesn't anybody real. ever say, this just might not be a good idea? You know, none of like them. How did the five of us say, let's right. do something? Listen, so they called themselves the fractured intellectuals, and they found each other, and they would meet and do things together. It's amazing the likeness that they all had in just sort of depravity, you know, just bad things, thinking badly, right. you know, hurting people, doing, doing crazy things. And then uh, at Peloton, I wrote the book, uh, and that's sort of my... Uh, whole spiel that I give. So I'll, I do this normally in a four-hour <laughs> yeah. gig, so I try to do it you know, quickly. I've been cancer-free for like a couple months now. I've been right. constantly getting asked how I figured out I had cancer like my stuff. Right. And I'm already bored with it, but how do you not get bored with telling the story for years now? You know, it's, you know what it is? And that's such a great question. I'm flying to Texas, Dallas um, on the 17th. And you're going to say the whole thing again? whole thing again. Oh, man. Two and a half hours, I'll go through that with Robert. This is all like 500 cops, mm -hmm. and I'll just go through the whole thing. You know what it is for me? It's a catharsis. It's a release of, oh, my God. Because for years in the FBI, you can't say a lot. You know, yeah. you never can talk to the media unless you're a supervisor, which I was at one point. But you can't do it. Now that I have gotten through it, I like sharing it with people. Yeah. And if it helps law enforcement, you know, make better decisions, because we didn't do things perfectly. So I tell them, this is what I could have done better. This is where you might do something different. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it helps me, you know, just put it out, and it helps yeah. them. And so it works for everybody. But I never get tired of talking about it. <laughs> yeah, I never do. And you have to retire at 57 if you're a special agent. They only give you seven years to... and. Uh, they paid for a Ph.D. and got me through call, you know, school after. And then I ended up coming uh, and setting up my second career. And I'm going to tell you, James, people want to hire retired 20-plus year retired federal agents. Yeah. I'm telling you, you, I'm turning away stuff. I, I got so much stuff to do. So it's just the way it works. You know, mm -hmm. it's just you know, they know your background solid, and they know you've been through a lot of, you've seen a lot of things. So, uh, yeah, at 50. So I retired. This finished me. I said, not much else is going to ever match something like this. Yeah. Uh, so I did a few cases after that, you know, were still important because everybody's a victim and you, you take care of everybody. Yes? Where does this case rank in the FBI hierarchy of craziness? Well, if you so look at, and the he, listen, 180, he's exactly right. When you look, James, you're a real student, I'm telling you. Yeah, I you, you, I'm really impressed. I'm not even kidding you. I mean, not that I was thinking anything other no, than no, that. No, 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 no. But you, because I'm talking so fastly, fast, it's probably hard to figure out what I'm even saying. But you, you really got it down. Um, yeah, 203. There's only been, you know, that many major cases elevated to that status. So the complexity and the craziness elevated. 
And then when it's a major case, you have all the resources the FBI bears. Mm -hmm. Any monies you need, any, they were flying me in equipment. They, it was crazy, the major case level. So, but then the director's got his eyes. So I was getting calls from the director of the FBI <laughs> asking me what the update is. So when you think of that high level pressure. Is that because the worldwide media interest? Oh, absolutely. Because they didn't know if it was an international event. They thought it would look like a Colombian situation. They, they didn't know if it was terrorist related. So yeah, this was a big deal. I mean, a bomb, never before in the history of the FBI had someone worn a bomb into a bank that detonated during the course of the robbery. There's just never it happened. When you think about that, that's pretty crazy. So that's what makes us so high level. Changed me completely. Number one, I didn't like to speak to anybody but one person at a time. Okay. Fearful. Uh, I don't know if you had to do that now that you're, you know, in your position, famous, and you know, has that changed you like that? Um, I can, I can, I'm getting better at it. He's getting better at it. Listen, great with kids, but guys our age kind of. Listen, I hated it. I still don't really enjoy it. But now that's all I do. So what it's done is it's taken me out of my comfort zone. I had a comfort zone of a few people. Yeah. And now that's all I do is talk. And then you're probably thinking, this guy talks it like crazy. I hated it. Yeah. But I had to. I'm doing those briefings, and I, I hated it. And now all of a sudden, it's become almost en energizing and power-inducing. Uh, to speak like that. I'll tell you what, I still can eat the pie. Yeah, I love the pizza. Now, I don't go in there that much anymore because yeah. poor Tony, the owner of the pizza shop, I had to run through the mill, obviously, because he has two dead guys within three days. I mean, I'm looking at him hard. Right. And uh, you know what I tell my students? Not only do investigators figure out who did something, you have to figure out who didn't do something right. and get them out. Would you eventually apologize to him? Yeah, you tell him, listen, Tony, you got to understand. And I wasn't rude or anything, but, I mean, you were asking him questions that are personal in nature and were really uh, on him pretty good. But I'd say, Tony, you know uh, this is nothing personal. I just have to figure out if... And it's like a parent when the child gets kidnapped. Yeah. I mean, who are you? You're on that parent. Right. And unfortunately, they just went through a traumatic event. Now they're dealing with the police hounding them. Well, you got to know that a nine... I don't know what the percentage is. It's a high, high percentage that it involves a parent mm -hmm. with a child. So uh, you got to do that. And unfortunately, yeah, you do say, hey, sorry that we had to put you through that, but you know, we appreciate you getting through it and hope we treated you with dignity. said we've got uh, Erie County Sheriff's Office um, and we had an EMS here to make sure uh, so we have a combination of people from multiple agencies and that's the AP. way they work as a unit that's the way they work as a unit it's, it's, so it's a like, regional squad it's a regional bomb squad exactly and they do tremendous things so they may have a call out or a pager call out system where if they have to gather and come together that's what they do and that's cooperation. I mean, that's right. heads of agencies getting along, not just people working on the street. So this is good stuff. God gave you that ability mm -hmm. to go touch people and you're doing it. And I'm so proud of you so much. It means a lot. I'm not kidding. Lot.